In the 1920s, a group of naturalists came to an island off the south coast of Australia with a mission. They believed some of Australia's unique animal species were in danger on the mainland. The men released 18 koalas into the unspoiled wilderness of Kangaroo Island. Unaware of the long-term consequences for the island and its eucalypt forests, the koalas quickly made themselves at home. The new arrivals began to feast on trees that had never encountered an animal with such an appetite. the sounds of koala courtship began to echo round the forests. Each generation of young found a seemingly endless supply of eucalyptus leaves. Today, tourists come to the island to see the thousands of their descendants. But the koalas have been slowly destroying their own habitat. When the full extent of the damage was discovered, the government urgently appointed a task force to find a solution. The task force recommended shooting 2,500 koalas as the only humane and realistic method of saving the forests. The government says it fears a huge international backlash if South Australia was to become the first state to kill koalas. We do kill uh, kangaroos, but uh, the community have said very, very clearly to me and to this government that they do not want to see koalas culled. It would have massive damage to South Australia's international reputation and quite frankly would destroy the tourism industry here. Oh. Buddy. The government, frightened of losing the tourist dollar, ignored the task force. Instead, they opted for a more expensive, less controversial program. The 2,500 koalas had to be captured. It's on the ground. Male koalas were given a vasectomy. Females, a tubal ligation. Many were relocated to the mainland. The program took two years and cost $630,000. At the western end of Kangaroo Island lies the Flinders Chase National Park. The park is a major attraction for tourists and for scientists.
how big he is. Yeah. He's a beaut. The koala controversy showed that an investigation was needed into how koalas kill trees. It's really noticeable these two trees on the corner here. Research funds became available for Sulim Kani to begin a study into what had happened to the trees. One of the results of the task force was that a couple of people got together and decided that it would be a good idea to run a research project which looked at the interaction of the koalas with the trees. This has um, been up for about a month, this, this guard. How's the tree going? Yeah, it's starting to show signs of uh, recovery. There's certainly some green tips out there. Early the, on, uh, the day-to-day -day research activities for me were, first of all, trying to get a better understanding of what koalas did in trees. I guess it's no real surprise that people call koalas tree spuds because they do spend most of the day sleeping, you know, somewhere between 20 and 22 hours. It, it varies from koala to koala. To avoid disturbing the koalas, Su Lim used a red spotlight. A lot of the time you could just be sitting there trying to stay warm, hoping that the koala would do something, because then that would be of some interest and the time goes a bit faster. You can go for six hours and not write one thing on the data sheet. The koala wouldn't have even lifted its head or yawned or, or scratched itself or anything. It just stays completely static. And then in the late evening is probably when it gets most exciting for the observers because that's when the koalas really do start feeding quite a fair bit. After two years and many cold nights, Su Lim's observations paid off. The 24-hour observations have shown that the koalas tend to, within a single day, eat in only one or two locations in a tree. And when a koala's feeding, it tends to just sit in one spot and eat pretty much all the leaves that it can grab onto it around it. The consequence of that is that single branches become quite heavily defoliated. Often branches will only have a handful of leaves left on them. The koalas were killing the trees one branch at a time. <laughs> it's my hand. <laughs> To see how far the koalas had spread, Sulim caught and tracked individual koalas. These are always so fiddly. <laughs> Tracking an animal involves a lot of time, uh, a lot of walking through paddocks, through bits of scrub, and often I could end up two kilometres or, or more from where I'd started, and in quite isolated areas. I really had no idea where it might end up. It could be in the tree that was in yesterday, it could be a, a kilometre and a half away. Over time, a lot of the radio-coloured koalas have moved all over the place. In Pandana, there was a bit of a problem there because, unbeknownst to me, the collar on the koala was actually sending out a signal that interfered with the television reception. He's paying it! He's paying it, Phil! He's on out the water! Well, can he kick half a dozen? He hasn't done much. He's lucky to get that. It's a so I had to catch the koala and put a different type of collar on it. People had dismissed the wandering koalas as animals moving between their favourite food trees or males looking for a mate. Sue Lim discovered 
that the animals were living and breeding successfully in unlikely places, and that numbers could be as high as 15,000, three times the original population estimate. Sterilization and relocation programs were ineffective. The high numbers made them impractical and far too costly. The program was suspended. No other solution has taken its place. Past tourist sites show evidence of what's to come. The popular Hanson's Bay Sanctuary could be the next lot of trees to die. But it's not just the tourists who will suffer. In the past, koalas released onto islands have multiplied, eaten out their habitat, and starved to death. There were no platypuses on Kangaroo Island. But in 1928, three were imported and released into the Rocky River. It was a good place for platypus, particularly in winter when the Rocky River flows. But in the island's long summers, it dries to a series of shallow pools. Robert Ellis is the current district ranger at Flinders Chase. With a group of volunteers, he runs a trapping program. Well, we have a platypus. So, and there's a remain of a yabby in the... Uh... What we're trying to do with this trapping program is to try and determine what sort of population there is, general condition of the animal, and compare that with animals from the mainland. The weight of platypus on Kangaroo Island tends to be less than those of the mainland. Well, I got him up. Let's do this. They're quite amazing um, creatures. They are a lot smaller than people imagine they are. There's a shield on the front and the bottom. The bottom one is not as developed, but you can see why they thought this was a hoax animal, because it looks as though someone's just stuck something on the front of it. Over the four days of trapping, six animals are caught. So far, research has captured 75 animals over a five kilometre stretch of river. It's a high density. Whether it is too high is yet to be discovered. At the end of summer, beginning of autumn, when it's very dry, the number of platypus sightings and the number of animals we, we capture through the trapping program diminishes considerably. We're not sure whether they're, they're going into burrows and seeing out the dry period, um, or they're actually moving um, away from these deep pools. It's quite exciting. We're not sure where they go. They simply vanish somewhere. How did it come there? Oh, it's, um, it's now a bog and sort of the men responsible for the introductions were the Flora and Fauna Board of South Australia. 
they were a dedicated group of naturalists keen to preserve wildlife for future generations. The Mali fowl and the Cape Barren goose were introduced. As were two hairy-nosed wombats, both males, unfortunately. One mainland emu survived until 1999, after surviving an earlier encounter with a bus. They continued their work until the 1940s when the National Park Service took over and a new generation of biologists came to the island. Brian Green, Peggy Rissmiller and Mike McKelvey live and work on Kangaroo Island. Their study of Rosenberg's goanna shows how modern technology is part of biological research. Goannas are mostly found in warmer climates and on Kangaroo Island they only survive by using termite mounds to incubate their eggs and their hatchlings during the cold winter months. For cold-blooded animals, an island this far south can be a very cold place in winter. Frequent storms bring icy winds from the southern ocean. The young goannas thrive all the way through to spring in the warmth and high humidity provided by the termite mounds. They emerge as temperatures start to rise. Once outside, they must bask in the direct sun, warming their bodies until they're able to start their search for food. Brian Green is able to observe their progress literally from the bottom of his garden. What usually happens is that within a very short period of time, the young get picked off by various predators, the ones that we we know most about are in fact the corvid birds like currawongs, ravens, magpies. There are three times as many adult male goannas as there are females on the island and the researchers would like to know if they hatch that way or if more females are getting picked off by predators. To find the answer they must get inside the mounds. We have uh, a lot of evidence that this type of research isn't actually hurting the population, but we're actually learning a lot from it. And uh, we're learning a lot about the termites at the same time. You can really see the importance of the mound as an incubator. It's warm and humid, and, uh, and when you put your hands in there, you can really tell it's a very, very sort of comfortable environment for rearing eggs. Eggshell. I've got one. Here's the first one. There you go, Brian. Look how big he is. Yeah. He's you big. can't tell the sex of a hatchling by just looking. DNA technology helps the scientists tell male from female, and whether there are more males even at this early stage. Much information can be gained from a simple toenail. Three males to every female means that a dominant adult male has to guard his female carefully. By mating constantly over the ten days she's fertile, the dominant male attempts to keep the female away from the unattached males. It's a surprisingly tender affair.
Other males will try their luck. When one appears, the mating female scurries to the safety of the burrow, while the dominant male sees off the intruder. Now we've seen pretty regular, like... But the researchers now believe this strategy has become less successful. After studying these animals for years, they've noticed females with more than one partner. They would like to know if rogue males are fathering any of the hatchlings and whether this is connected to evidence of nest marauding and cannibalism amongst the Goanna population. With DNA samples of the young already obtained, they must now match those samples with the DNA of the adult males in the breeding area. They scan to see if the animal has been caught before. This one hasn't and is taken back to the research centre for testing. The new DNA technology is capable of mapping out a detailed family tree of the goannas in the area. Take the bag off. It may be possible that one clutch of eggs will turn out to have several different fathers and even that one of the fathers is cannibalizing his own offspring. There you go. There you go. Perfect. The word is just 100 alcohol. minimum, yeah. The early Kangaroo Island naturalists concerned themselves with the protection of endangered land animals. Today, the high profile of marine life in the area brings scientists to the waters that surround the island. Kate Rodder from the South Australian Research and Development Institute studies the great white shark. The sharks are considered endangered, but little is known about them. Ever since I can remember, I've always been fascinated by them. I've got books and books that I've had for 25 years on sharks and shark attacks. And just always had that interest. I think they've been the bad guy and I'm trying to help make look a little less bad. The Great Whites are regular visitors to these waters for one reason. It means access to a major source of food. For both the New Zealand fur seal and Australian sea lion, the southern beaches of Kangaroo Island provide important resting sites. The seals swim for three hours to reach feeding grounds at the edge of the continental shelf. It can be a dangerous swim. No one is sure of the size of the remaining shark population. So as you can imagine, it's very hard to calculate how many animals are actually out there and you've heard lots of wild accusations of 50 or thousands and, and no one really knows but um, tagging is one way of, of getting an indication of the population. On this trip Kate is working with dive boat operator Rolf Sebaski. They've come to the nearby Neptune Islands to place an electronic tag on one of the Great Whites. They must choose a shark that is known to return here so the tag can be recovered at a later date. Hello, sweetheart. Hello, sweetheart. Come here, Papa. That's a girl. Thanks, Sabrina. Could be Blackie. Could be Blackie. Rolf has kept records of all the sharks he's seen in the area. Uh -huh. here. Morning. Morning. Kate decides to go down in the cage to get more detail. What you're doing is a very dangerous thing. Be very careful. You see a shark in front of you, but there might be one in the back of you. I just put the markings down. Whatever you see is a male, female, and what tag it has. Yep, so you just try and bring him in as close as you can. I bring him as close as possible with the bite, so no worries. The advantage of 
of using the cage to assist in the research is, is you're able to see more of the animal than you could on the surface. You can see the underbelly of the animal, you can see whether it's a male or a female, you can see more the distinguishing features, the scars, the white dots that sometimes they have, um, the bits of fins that are missing. In the cage when the shark's circling, you really you don't feel any fear because you feel quite safe playing the cage, but you can it's almost like the cage isn't there too. You can almost be in the same world as the animal and just watch it. It's just a beautiful animal, graceful, magnificent. The archival tag has sensors that will give Kate a diary of the shark's journey. Four and a half metre fish. That is him, that is him. They decide on Moni, the 4.5 metre male with the algae covered tag. You are my little boy. The last great white tag here never made it back. It was captured 600 kilometers west in a fisherman's net. Even so, the electronic pages of the tag diary contained valuable data of its travels along the southern coast. Hopefully, Moni will return alive to download his story. Biologist David Payton brings a group of honours students to the island. They travel to the Flinders Chase field station that provides an important base for the scientific community. David Payton has been coming here for years to study the ways that birds and bees pollinate the native plants. And crescent honey eaters get their names because of this crescent mark which comes down over the shoulders. Can you see that there? Black and then a bit of white. Yep. And often the easiest way of just securing them, just to keep them firm, is to hold their beak. Right. Okay. How are you going to identify it? You're a, you're a young budding scientist. <laughs> yeah, but I'm not a bird person. Bird. He's starting to get yeah. There he goes. David Payton is concerned that feral honeybees are damaging the plant life of the island. The honeybees were brought in hives from Italy in the 1890s, but many have escaped and have developed large feral colonies. Native vegetation has co-evolved with indigenous bees. They're perfectly suited to each other. David Payton believes native plants, and therefore their pollinators, are now in danger from the increasingly dominant feral honeybees. Most people have assumed that when they're brought to another country, they will simply provide the same pollination services to the plants. But there's a big difference between honeybees, say, and native bees. Native bees are mostly solitary. They raise their young in their own individual tunnels. Some, like these carpenter bees, make burrows in decaying timber.
Another native, Nomia australis, congregate where soil conditions allow deep burrowing. More than one female may share a nest, but there is no cooperative behaviour. There are no queens and workers, and no commercially exploitable honey. The feral bees have an advantage because their group behaviour creates higher temperatures. The temperature within a honey bee hive is as high as 36 degrees centigrade. In the native bees' burrows, it is only 12 degrees. Both species need warmth to fly. The warmth in the hive means the feral bees can get an early start to the day. One of the plants we work on is a plant called Orthrosanthus multiflorus, this lovely blue iris. Honeybees will come in and start foraging on the flowers just as they start to open at the beginning of the day. They only open for one day each flower. By the time the native bees are getting ready to come and forage on this plant, the honeybees have visited some of the flowers 10 or 20 times. And we know from their first visit they can remove 87% of the pollen. So after 20 visits, there's virtually no pollen left. There may be the odd flower dotted around the landscape, which the bees just happen to miss. And that's then what the native bees will come to visit. Honeybees may not be as good at pollinators as the native bees for some of these flowers. They haven't evolved with the native flowers. While the native bees have, and they may be just that much more efficient and capable of transferring pollen between flowers. The feral bees also compete for hollows with nesting parrots. The competition is one more difficulty the beautiful glossy black cockatoo could do without. They're on the critically endangered list, which means there is a strong possibility of extinction within 20 years. The only place this subspecies now survives is on Kangaroo Island. There are less than 300 left. These are the female feathers with the different colours and they're more beautiful and these are the male feathers and I... The glossies have found themselves the focus of enormous popular interest. In there, about three to four Their battle for survival has struck a chord with the locals. The image of the cockatoo regularly pops up in artworks, poetry, school photo competitions. And the fight to keep the glossy black alive has stirred Kangaroo Islanders' sense of community. The birds' problems begin with their fastidious eating habits. They eat nothing but the cones of these drooping she-oak. And the cones are not the easiest food to eat. Just getting to the good bit takes time and effort. There's not a lot to these seeds. Breeding birds have to eat around 100 cones every day. That's 8,000 seeds. It takes all day. They nest in winter when conditions are harsh for nestlings left alone for most of the day. Some nests have large openings with no protection from the wind and the rain. Tough conditions in the nest often lead to the loss of a nestling. Without human intervention, 
the glossy black cockatoo would almost certainly die out. Lynn Pedler is a farmer from the mainland. He's also the field biologist involved in a government-funded but community-based rescue program. The population now is down to about 250 birds. So anything which reaches such a low number is, is uh, at some risk. Through the, the work the rescue team has done, we've managed to show that it's now increasing slowly. We have a target figure of about 400 birds, and it'll take some time to reach that. Some of the nesting goes right through the winter, and, and the, the late nests can tend to get a lot of cold, wet weather. You can get uh, water logging, eggs lost through being flooded. Lynn spends long periods alone in the bush, tracking the remaining flocks around the island, trying to protect the survivors. They're a bit unpredictable, and sometimes you spend a great deal of time looking for them because they'll be feeding in one area for two or three weeks, and all of a sudden that they'll, they'll go off to another gully and start feeding there. They're a, really a, an indicator of how successful conservation work in an area such as this can be. If you can conserve one of the, the larger species well, it, it also means that you're helping a range of other species. His tracking often means he has to camp out overnight, close to the flocks. Night can be hazardous for a young, glossy black. Brush-tailed possums are an abundant species on Kangaroo Island. They compete with the glossies for hollows. Early monitoring we did of the cockatoos' nests has shown that uh, possums contribute to a large proportion of the, the losses of eggs and young ones. Tin bands around the nest trees can help keep the possums out, but now recent arrivals to the island are disrupting the nests. Prior to uh, white settlement, glossies probably didn't have to cope with other, other large cockatoos interfering with their nests. And, and now they've got galahs and corellas and sulphur-crested cockatoos, which have all increased with, uh, with agricultural development. With the adult glossies out all day feeding, the juveniles are vulnerable to the invading cockatoos. Galahs are opportunists and they're likely to throw out an egg. Corellas have been known to kill unattended young glossies. What the island needs is more nest hollows. I prefer to use a natural piece of hollow log, but they're fairly hard to come by in, in South Australia. We've uh, chosen an alternative of using a 30 centimetre diameter PVC stormwater pipe. It's much easier to, to handle, it's weatherproof. These artificial hollows are a success. One in three nesting glossies chooses them each season. Unfortunately, so do other cockatoos. One of the most important community events for the year is the annual census. The census requires a good turnout of volunteers, so choosing a date means fitting in with the other local events. It couldn't be the last week of September because that's the football grand final. It couldn't be the third weekend of October, because that's the King's Coach show. And Saturday the 7th, the Stokes Bay mob has tennis. So, Sunday the 8th, it was. 
nice winning banana cake. <laughs> Just to get people out of an evening to, to search for cockatoos' nests is, is uh, not that easy. Community plays a pretty large part of the whole process. It, it wouldn't be possible for one or two or three people to get around the whole island and, and then run a census. So what did you come up with, Lynn, what did you reckon? Um, 20, either 25 or 27, I think. Flying over or were they out of sight? No, I've got a whole page here. Very good, thanks. <laughs> What's it add up to? I don't think we had any come in from the north, so... No. But there, one was chirping and carrying yeah. on, and then at 6... They, they didn't go on, they came No, back. they yeah. just stayed there, and at 6.23 they we, came we back again. Look at, look at it, look. Another egg has survived the possums, the wet weather, and the other nesting cockatoos. The chick has not been fed today. The adult waits on a nearby branch. If the fledgling wants to eat, she will have to embark on her first flight. In two or three years, she too will be ready to lay her own single egg. For the locals, this is a small victory in an ongoing battle. The Kangaroo Island Hunt Club meets on the first Sunday of every month to uphold the grand traditions of this age-old sport. The fact that there are no foxes on Kangaroo Island doesn't seem to bother them. The absence of foxes is the critical factor in one of the island's great successes, the Cape Barren Goose. Before open seasons were abandoned in 1961, the Cape Barren Goose was shot by farmers whenever possible. Their numbers had fallen to dangerous levels. But from the small number introduced to Kangaroo Island by the Flora and Fauna Board, the geese are now a self-sustaining population. Today, they number in the thousands, and the population is steadily increasing. These birds face a different problem to the glossy blacks. Geese numbers are too high. So much so, there is a danger they will start to damage their habitat. Local authorities are studying ways to control the population before the problem gets out of hand. When it comes to overpopulation on Kangaroo Island, nothing compares with the Tamar wallaby. There are an estimated one million Tamar wallabies on the island. In complete contrast to the ban on culling koalas, farmers are given permits to shoot 20,000 wallabies each year. By day, the paddocks that provide the whole population with an abundance of food are empty. The tamars hide in the nearby patches of dense bush, feeding on more traditional foods, such as prickly acacia. Predators and massive clearing on the mainland has all but wiped out this beautiful wallaby. <coughs> Kangaroo Island is one of its last refuges. Tamars have an extremely successful breeding strategy. 90% of females carry a pouch young each year. While last year's young remained in the pouch, 
A female can carry an embryo of 80 to 100 cells in suspended development. As the summer solstice approaches, increasing hours of sunlight impact on the pineal glands and trigger development. One month later, all the fetuses are ready to be born and make their journey to the pouch. The baby struggles free of its amniotic membranes. Using its highly developed forelimbs, it begins its climb. The mother licks behind and over the baby, possibly to prevent dehydration. The climb takes about two minutes. Once there, it locates one of the four available teats. Females come into season immediately, and mating occurs one hour after they've given birth. The males patrol the females, testing for signs that a female is preparing to give birth. In a highly competitive situation, males fight off other males before resuming their courtship. For females, the abundance of male partners makes for a busy night. The lack of controversy over the culling of the Tamar highlights that the wildlife we choose to save has as much to do with politics, economics and sentimentality as it does with science. Researchers often find themselves as lobbyists, fundraisers and publicists in the midst of their studies. The old field station in Flinders Chase has always played a vital part in these studies. For decades it has drawn scientists to the island providing a place to stay and work down the remote western end. Somewhere to socialise with park staff and enjoy this special wild place. Somewhere to monitor both the positive and the negative legacies of the gentlemen of the Flora and Fauna Board. Thank you.